we're, we're like half an hour talking and then and then some questions yeah perfect perfect okay okay so good morning everybody thank you for joining our weekly cast conference and it's a real pressure pleasure to have darren Millot from galway uh darren is really one of the people i think who's an expert in both coronary and structural intervention has really been in his career really impactful and i've learned so much from you daryl about what I do every day, and I still use things you've taught me uh, in meetings every day. So I'm looking forward to hearing your talk on Tava for bicuspid aortic valve stenosis. Thanks, Azim, and, and thanks for having me. It's it's great to to see you and Juan. And uh, as we've just been talking offline, it's been too long, and hopefully we all get together soon and uh, can have some in-person meetings. Absolutely. So I'm gonna spend the next 30 odd minutes talking a little bit about TAVR, right? TAVR, not TAVI. Uh, I have to mind my, my R's. Uh, for bicuspid aortic valve, uh, are we there yet? And I, I have a particular opinion on it, and um, I would be, of course, delighted to, to discuss that um, uh, with some questions at, at the end. So the broad outline is to talk about some of the anatomical issues that face us uh, when considering um, uh, tavern bicuspid aortic valves. Uh, briefly touch on the sizing conundrum, and I know that, um, uh, that some other speakers have, have discussed this in more detail, so I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, talk about some retrospective and, and prospective observational data, and then really give a call for uh, a randomized controlled trial of TAVR versus TAVR, particularly in younger patients with bicuspid AS. First, I think it's important to understand the magnitude of the problem and, and the magnitude of the problem from the surgical community's point of view, in that about 50% of younger patients who undergo FABR uh, have bicuspid aortic valve morphology. And that, that's obviously a big number of patients. Um, we also need to remember um, uh, that in those patients, uh, they tend to have more challenging valve morphology. We used to think, well, as, as we go to younger patients, we'll have less complications. But that may not be true in the presence of bicuspid aortic valve disease. The bicuspid patient tends to be younger and have less comorbidity, um, has a more rapid recovery, but demands that more rapid recovery, is keen on re returning to work or, or, or activities, um, but also has greater valve calcification and more challenging morphology, and overall is going to be less tolerant of even what we consider to be relatively minor complications in the TAVR field that we've experienced to date. The bicuspid anatomy is different, and it's important that we understand this, these differences when we're considering the role of TAVI in these patients. And it's most important that we remember that the cardiac surgeon is largely agnostic to BAV anatomy. Of course, I'm not talking about aorthopathy where they have to do a root replacement uh, or put a graft in. But whether the valve is a Sievers 1, Sievers 2, has a long RAFE, a short RAFE, commissural fusion, LBOT calcium, None of these things really matter to the surgeon, but they can impact the outcome with TAVI um, greatly. And therefore, right, right, um, right from the get-go, when we compare TAVI to surgery, we're, we're up against it because the things that hurt us don't necessarily hurt the surgeon. And the things that hurt the surgeon don't necessarily um, or, or aren't necessarily that, that impactful like they would be in an 85-year-old with kidney disease and prior stroke. So although it's not a competition between surgery and TAVI, I think it's important to know that surgeons get great outcomes um, uh, with, with surgical aortic valve replacement in younger patients with bicuspid. We're going to have to up our game there are, uh, with respect to TAVI. Um, the first being a RAFE, which is usually calcified um, uh, and of variable length. Um, the maximal calcification of the RAFE is about six to eight millimeters above the annulus. And that's unusual for us because all of our devices are designed to give us maximal expansion force at the base of the device or the inflow of the device uh, at the level of the annulus. And now we need um, more expansion force higher up above the annulus. We have dense leaflet calcification that is more significant than with tricuspid aortic valves. Um, it's possible that the calcium is more friable it's certainly asymmetric. We have differential sinus depth that can impact pacemaker uh, uh, rates, can impact leaflet uh, or can impact uh, implant depth. Commissural fusion, which can be an issue for bicusp or uh, particularly in, in self-expanding valves. Um, the horizontal annulus is not, uh, not a big deal um, uh, for, um, for short valves, 
Um, but for, for longer, um, stiffer valve frames, it can be. Aortopathy, of course, is an issue and also concomitant aortic regurgitation, whereby the patients can become unstable or the valve implantation can be a little bit um, uh, tenuous given the movement of the frame. These are some, some cases that, that, that I've seen with both balloon expandable and self-expanding valves whereby by, by cusp anatomy has caused major difficulty. So here's an S3 case, um, typical setup uh, ready for the implantation. Uh, the valve is an appropriate depth. Uh, it expands uh, uh, nicely, but comes up against a big chunk of calcium uh, which leads to malexpansion of the valve frame, severe transvalvular leak, uh, and the requirement for a valve and valve. Here's one that we had a couple of weeks ago in Galway, a severely calcified um, bicuspid Sievers type 1 valve with a raffe between the left and right. Uh, and this is the post-implant view. You'll notice that this looks like a self-expanding valve, but in fact it's not. This is a safety in three that was put in a couple of millimeters too low. Therefore, there was not enough force in the valve to open up that raffe. And you can see from these arrows um, the, cal the piece of calcium that we see on the post-operative specimen when the valve was going to be opened. Um, and you can see that we were just unable to open the valve frame and notice, so this patient had severe transvalvular leak. Here's a self-expanding case, seems to be a very typical implant, um, but as we release the valve, you'll notice that the valve is popping up uh, and jumps out. So a champagne cork implantation. And here's one I'd rather not speak about again, uh, complete compression of a uh, of a 34 millimeter valve and a very calcified anatomy. And really this all comes down, this complexity comes down due to different uh, calcium distribution in bicuspid aortic valves. In tricuspid aortic valves, it's at the leaflet tips and the bases of the sinus where you get that calcification. Now the leaflet tip is not an issue because that will simply fold back into the sinuses. And at the base, well, that's where we size our valves and where we do our anchoring and sealing. And so the valve designs we have are prepared for that. On the other hand, in bicuspid morphology, the, the dense calcification is found not at the tips or the bases, but right in the body of the leaflet. And on average, as I mentioned, about six to eight millimeters above the level of the annulus. And our, de our devices are not specifically designed for this calcification. This is a typical case, very severe leaflet calcification. But as we drop down the leaflet, you'll see this big chalk, chunk of calcium coming from both sides. If a balloon expandable valve impacts this calcium, it's just gonna push it to the side and a self-expanding valve may not be able to open this kind of disease. Not only is it the location of the calcium, but also the distribution. And we very often see very high calcium volumes uh, in patients with, um, uh, with bicuspid aortic valve morphology. And it's also notable that these calcium volumes are higher in younger patients who have severe AS with bicuspid aortic valve compared to older patients. Hassan Jilhawi and his team have done some, some really important work in, in redefining um, BAV morphology uh, into uh, RAFE type, non-RAFE type, um, uh, calcified RAFE or, or not. And really, I, I think it's very important that we don't consider all bicuspid valves to be, to be the same in the same way that we consider largely all tricuspid valves to be the same. Um, there are a variety of different sizes and shapes of bicuspid aortic valves. Uh, and they can, oops, uh, and they can uh, impact our procedural and potentially our longer term outcome. Didier Teche and his group in Toulouse have also done some work on this, um, and they came up with this configuration of the tube, the flare, and the taper based on the aortic annulus size and comparing that aortic annulus size to the intercommissural diameter at four millimeters above the annulus. Again, it's important to remember that most of the trouble with bicuspid aortic valve is about six to eight millimeters above the level of the annulus. And therefore, in, in, um, in many patients, these configurations may be, um, may be more complex than, than initially described. These are some of the cases that I've been involved in. And what you'll notice from this is that these are all bicuspid valves, but no two are alike. You have different lengths of raffe, different calcifications of, la of raffe, commissural fusion, thickened leaflets, um, uh, three sinuses, two sinuses. Um, and, and it's important to understand that there are bicuspid valves and there are real, really severe bicuspid aortic valves. And, and I think great credit has to go to Sung Han Yoon and Raj Makar, who have done a huge amount of work in this space. Um, and they published, for me, um, the, the most important paper in the bicuspid aortic valve 
Taver Field and the Lagan Tavi and Bath. And they broke those three uh, groups into those who had uh, uh, no significant leaflet uh, calcification or, or no excess leaflet calcification or excess uh, RAFE calcification. Uh, those that had um, uh, moderately calcified RAFE or um, uh, severe leaflet calcification, or those that had both severe leaflet calcification and a severely calcified RAFE. This group, this latter group, um, accounted for uh, one quarter of all BAV cases, and they had three times the mortality of those patients that didn't have both of these features. Not only that, but they had a 4.5% risk of, a, of aortic root injury and a 6.5% risk of moderate paravalvar leak. So there is a subset of bicuspid aortic valves um, that have increased mortality increased procedural complications and a worse long-term outcome um, compared, to, compared to others. And I think it's important that we remember that, that certain bicuspid aortic valve anatomies represent a procedural and possibly a longer-term outcome uh, for TAVR. Moving on then to bicuspid sizing, and a lot has been made of this. And the reason that bicuspids are sized somewhat differently or perhaps should be sized somewhat differently to, um, uh, to tricuspid aortic valves really comes down to the concept of the, the bicuspid volcano. That in tricuspid aortic valves, um, we uh, size and anchor the device at the level of the annulus. On the other hand, because we have a raffe or because we have that dense leaflet calcification further up uh, in bicuspids, we tend to anchor and seal in a superannular space uh, or at the level of the leaflet. And this discrepancy between the annulus and the superannular space um, creates the difficulty that we have uh, for bicuspid aortic valve sizing. Here's a case example. Um, here's a, a, a case where the perimeter is 80.9. This would be a 29 millimeter Evolute Pro. If we measure using intercommercial distance, that's 28 millimeters, meaning we need a 34 millimeter Evolute Pro. Um, and if we use a superannular spline measurement, this gives us a 26 millimeter Evolute Pro. So we have three different valve sizes for the same anatomy, depending on where um, we, we take these measurements. If we take a valve that is too big, well, then we risk annular rupture, potentially embolization like the champagne cork uh, one I showed you, frame malexpansion, which is associated with subclinical leaflet thrombosis and potentially durability issues, frame distortion, redundant leaflet tissue that causes increased stresses and strains on the leaflet. And again, leaflet folds that can do exactly the same thing. This can lead to high transvalvular gradients, transvalvular regurgitation, thrombosis, and all of these can have an impact on durability. TAVI has, has really prided itself um, on the hemodynamic performance that, that we've been able to achieve, uh, certainly relative to, to surgical aortic valves, and certainly with super, uh, uh, superannular valves. Um, but if we start taking smaller valves because of the need to superannular size, does that mean that we potentially lose this uh, hemodynamic advantage and therefore potentially en end up with, um, uh, with shorter durability of the valve compared to, our, uh, compared to the valves implanted by our surgical colleagues? Ultimately, sizing for tavern by cuspid aortic valve anatomy is an unresolved issue. Uh, and that remains the case for both superannular valves or self-expanding valves uh, and for balloon expandable valves. If I want to move on uh, briefly to the available data that we're using to justify TAVI in, in bicuspid aortic valves, um, uh, there are three to four of these very early data sets um, that I think first outline the problem um, associated with bicuspid aortic valve morphology. Um, uh, we were uh, um, um, uh, involved in, in the very first um, uh, data set. This was only 140 patients recruited between 2007 and 2013, um, mean age 79, STS about five. Only two thirds of these patients had CT sizing, but with 30 day mortality rates of 5%, um, moderate power valvular leak in nearly 30% of patients and very high pacemaker rates. Now, to a certain extent, this reflects um, um, historic TAVI practice, but even comparing these data to, um, to data sets of tricuspid valves at the same time, we certainly saw um, at much higher rates of complications. 
Again, Sung Han Yoon and Raj Makar came forth with an important uh, manuscript comparing uh, the early generation devices that you saw a few moments ago um, to the more recent devices, uh, Sapien 3, Lotus, and Avalut R in that case, and showed significant reduction in, in complications and procedural complications compared to those uh, early devices. But nevertheless, complication rates that were still a little bit too high for, um, uh, for what you would expect with tricuspid aortic valve. Uh, the same group, again, then published this important registry in JAMA, um, which was the TBT um, um, uh, ACC registry, looking at 30-day and one-year clinical outcomes in bicuspid versus tricuspid aortic valve, um, and for the first time noted a significant increase in stroke rates among patients with um, bicuspid compared to tricuspid aortic valve. And, and this really, for me, is, is, is maybe one of the most important issues um, when we consider uh, applying TAVR technology, particularly to younger patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease. Um, to touch on two more contemporary studies, um, Raj uh, uh, published this uh, only in September. Um, and this is an important STS-TBT-based registry uh, of patients undergoing balloon expandable valves between June 2015 and October 2020. Among 37,000 patients, they propensity matched uh, 3,168 um, BAV and TAV patients. Um, mean age 69, STS scores 1.7%. So these are young and low-risk patients. And very surprisingly, they found no difference in death at 30 days or one years between those uh, with bicuspid or tricuspid aortic valve. They found no difference in stroke, and they found no difference in procedural complications, valve hemodynamics, and moderate to severe PVL. Now, this study flies in the face pretty much of every other um, uh, or most other um, uh, large data sets. Uh, on, on uh, TAVI and bicuspid, and therefore we do have to consider whether there is residual confounding in these data sets. On the other hand, published last week in, uh, in JAK Intervention, a meta-analysis of 17 studies um, uh, uh, comprising uh, 181,000 patients undergoing TAVI, 7,600 of which had bicuspid aortic valve, and they found exactly the opposite. They found increased rates of moderate to severe PVL increased risks of stroke, uh, an increased risk of annular rupture uh, compared to patients who have tricuspid aortic valve. So we've got two different data sets um, coming to two very different conclusions uh, as to the safety and efficacy of TAVI and bicuspid compared to tricuspid aortic valve. And we therefore need to be cognizant that observational data are vulnerable to confounding from unrecognized or unrecorded uh, risk factors. Uh, therefore, Observational data such as these can be thought-provoking and um, hypothesis-generating, but should not be taken as solid evidence of, of safety and efficacy. More recently, we have seen um, some, pros some prospective data, particularly from, uh, um, from um, uh, Medtronic. They um, uh, sponsored the Bivalute X registry. This was 150 patients uh, recruited in Europe with bicuspid aortic valve stenosis. The study was led by Didier Teche and uh, Nicholas Van Liegen. Um, uh, all patients had an Evolute, o, uh, Evolute Pro or, or Evolute R at that time, 34 millimeter XL. Um, device. Um, the mean age in these 151 patients was 78 years of age. STS scores of 2.5%, so low risk patient, but still relatively elderly. Um, and if we look at their procedures, about 50% uh, of them had a 29 millimeter valve implanted, 2% um, required a second valve. And interestingly, about 85% needed pre dilatation and 55% post dilatation. So this data set for me confirms that, um, that um, uh, using self expanding valves in um, in patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease uh, tends to be a more complicated procedure. We tend to have to do more stuff um, to get a good result. Now, the results were excellent. All cause death um, uh, at uh, 30 days, 3.3%. But again, this issue of, of, of stroke comes to the fore. Disabling and non-disabling stroke, if you add them together, that's 4% stroke rate uh, in patients uh, with bicuspid aortic valve. 
Of course, these are site reported data, um, uh, which tends to undercall uh, particularly cerebral ischemic events. It wasn't all um, uh, difficulty though. We saw um, fantastic uh, hemodynamic data uh, with EOAs of, of approximately 2.1 mean gradients of 7.3% and moderate PBL rates of about 2%. So overall encouraging, encouraging data, uh, but some warning signs. Um, Basil um, Ramlaoui um, then pre presented the Evolute low risk data at ACC 2020. Again, the primary safety endpoint, all-cause mortality and disabling stroke of 30 days. This patient population, again, 150 patients, but considerably lower, um, or, or sorry, lower age um, than um, the, the European cohort, STS 1.4%, so low risk uh, cohort again. And the primary safety endpoint, which was death or disabling stroke, impressively low, 1.3%. But if we delve into that data a little bit again, Again, the combination of disabling and non-disabling stroke in a patient population of 70 years of age of 4% is to my mind um, still too high. Uh, and, and to my mind does not match what our surgical colleagues uh, uh, can provide. So overall, I think it's a fair statement to suggest that there are conflicting uh, observational data uh, regarding the safety and efficacy of TAVI um, uh, for, ta for, for bicuspid versus tricuspid aortic stenosis. Certainly to my mind, uh, I'm not convinced that we have, um, uh, that we can achieve the same results with bicuspid and tricuspid. And therefore we have some important knowledge gaps that we need to address. We have no randomized data versus SAVR for safety and efficacy. We do not know if our um, bicuspid aortic valve outcomes are TAVR specific. Are they better with balloon expandable valve where we get better expansion force and can push those RAFE to the side? Or are we better in fact not pushing those RAFE to the side but having the, the, the leaflets above the level of the RAFE and having better hemodynamics? It's unclear as to our valve sizing strategy for both of these devices. We're still not sure of predictors of adverse outcome though long RAFE calcified RAFE with excess calcification appear to be important predictors. And of course, we don't to date have any long-term data as to whether our, um, uh, our uh, smaller valves or potentially more deformed valves in bicuspid morphology um, uh, provide um, as good a durability as they do in tricuspid aortic stenosis. And so when we have equipoise, it is, I believe, justification for a randomized trial, not because we need another randomized trial um, for, for everything, but because we really, uh, to my mind, are, are, are unclear uh, in younger patients in particular, uh, whether a surgical approach or a TAVR approach uh, would be the optimal strategy. Um, it's interesting to note that the device companies um, have um, uh, done such an incredible job in taking TAVI from where it was to where it is, going through um, uh, extreme risk, high risk, intermediate risk, low risk, and ultimately into patients who are asymptomatic and patients who have moderate aortic stenosis. Yet none of them have, have um, put their head on the chopping block um, uh, yet to perform a randomized trial in bicuspid because I believe uh, they're not convinced that that's a study that they can beat surgery uh, as of yet. Even if you consider designing a randomized trial for TAVR versus SAVR and bicuspid, there are some important things that we would need to discuss. Well, first of all, who would fund the study? Would this be a, an industry sponsored study largely like we've had to date? Or uh, would a large funding body such as the NIH have to step in uh, to do this study? What's the most pr appropriate primary endpoint? Is it safety? Is it stroke? Um, is it durability of the device? Um, or do we include um, softer measures um, such as um, hospitalization like we saw in partner three? Which THV is more important? Balloon expandable valve, self-expandable valves? I think that's certainly an open question. And depending on which valve you use, well, what's the sizing algorithm that we're going to try and apply to these, to these patients? Is there an age threshold for inclusion? I don't think any of us would, would submit an 80 or an 85 year old or even a slightly younger patient to surgery um, just because they have a bicuspid aortic valve. But I'm not sure the same can be said for a 65 year old or a 75 year old. So is there a maximal age above which patients should not be included? In all randomized trials, we have exclusions. 
for example, to get into the partner trial, you couldn't have severe mitral regurgitation, you couldn't have um, uh, severe frailty. Um, but what about TAVR exclusions for, for a bicuspid trial? Would we take out those patients who have those severe calcium, um, calcium burdens and those very long calcified raphae? What about cerebral embolic protection devices with, with the TAVR arm? Would this be used as standard of care? I think many of us use embolic protection devices in, in bicuspids because they tend to be more complex and protracted procedures. And again, that stroke rate um, uh, remains concerning. Having said that, we don't have any strong data that these devices actually work. Of course, those trials are ongoing, but they're not, they're not here yet. And then what about the follow-up duration? Are we happy with one or two year data? Or in bicuspids in particular, um, do we need longer term data given the, uh, the hostile anatomy that we're implanting our TAVR devices into and the younger age of these patients um, at the time that, that we would plan to treat them? So to summarize, um, in terms of anatomy, one quarter of BAV patients have that, that hostile anatomy that we discussed, and in those patients, clinical outcomes seem to be inferior. Sizing, a uniform sizing algorithm for TAVR and bicuspid aortic valve is not currently available, and this remains a significant uh, shortcoming. From historical data or observational data, it's not clear that clinical outcomes of TAVR and bicuspid are equivalent to those in tricuspid aortic valve. There is certainly anatomical justification um, that results may be inferior in bicuspid aortic valve compared to tricuspid. And again, to reiterate that call, um, that we need a randomized trial of TAVR versus FAVR in bicuspid aortic valve anatomy, particularly for younger patients before we start expanding this technology uh, to, to, uh, to, to those younger cohorts. So, Azim, with that, I'll, um, I'll shut up for a moment and let you guys uh, um, have a discussion and, uh, and let me answer any questions I can. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, that, was, that was awesome. It was really a great presentation as usual. And I think it was a very balanced presentation because it really highlights a lot of the, the challenges we all face. Uh, and I think you've given everybody a lot to think. So I'm going to bring the fellows on. Uh, you'll see them come on here in the background. By the way, beautiful, beautiful picture. I assume this is the hospital in Galway where you work? This is the university that's situated right beside the hospital. So this oh, is a picture from the hospital. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> it's a great view. <laughs> um, so I'm going to let the, the fellows start. I have some, me and, and Juan have been talking. We have some questions of, of our own. But let's start with the fellows and we'll work our way down. Andrea. Hey, Darren. Thank you for this lecture. I wanted to ask you just a question. I know it's still a gap, but I wanted to know what is your opinion regarding implantation technique and the choice of the transcatheter heart valve for bicuspid cases? How do you approach them now? That, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, uh, Andrea, I, I think the first thing that, that you have to be is, is good at a particular valve. I think with bicuspids, there are particular things that you need to do. Um, and so um, I don't think you should change your standard practice. Um, uh, as in, if you use a lot of balloon expandable valve, then you're good at balloon expandable valve. Uh, and you should probably use that. If, on the other hand, you use self-expanding valve, then I think that's, uh, that's certainly the way to go. Um, for me, I use both, um, but would use uh, certainly more self-expanding valve uh, in these patients. Uh, and the first thing I, I think that's important is, is sizing. And we would always look at the annulus, then look at the superannular area and try to make sure we've got the right valve size in our hand. Um, second, uh, I, I pre-dilate every bicuspid aortic valve. Um, uh, particularly when using self-expanding valve. It's perhaps not so important when using, uh, when using balloon expandable valve, but if you do have a heavily calcified uh, valve, you, you, you can get stuck underneath the leaflet, even with balloon expandable valve, and it can be hard to get a high implantation position. Um, third would be to understand where the leaflet calcification is. If you're, um, for, if you're, for example, you have a raffe that is six millimeters higher than the, than the, uh, the annulus, 
then really you need to be trying to stick your, um, your, um, your valve a couple of millimeters higher to make sure that you have the expansion force at the level of the, uh, at the, level of the raffe. So for me with um, self-expanding valves, um, if, there's a if there's a long and calcified raffe, um, I would tend to implant the valve uh, at zero or one millimeter below the annulus um, in an REO caudal view, a cusp overlap view to make sure that I, I understand the depth of my implantation. Um, I, I, doing that, I think it's very rare that you get pop-ups, again, because you're constrained six or eight millimeters higher where the level of the raffe is. So just because you're one millimeter or, or, or so um, below the annulus, that's not where you're anchoring and sealing. You're anchoring and sealing much higher up. So pop-ups are very rare. Having said that, I always implant across uh, the annulus. I don't put the valve solely in the leaflets because I think that is, um, that's fraught with uncertainty in terms of how the valve will release and how it will, how it will move. Um, and then finally, I have a very low threshold for post dilatation. Um, if there's any sign of frame malexpansion, uh, I will go ahead and post dilate that valve, uh, even if it's a high implant at zero or one millimeters. Again, safe in the knowledge that I'm anchored and sealed uh, above at the level of the raffe. So uh, I think there are a couple of things that are that are different to a standard tricuspid aortic valve implant, um, and that they would that would be my practice. And since they are often young patients, aren't you concerned about implanting uh, in a high fashion a self-expanding valve for the coronary access? Yeah, again, a good a good question. We're, we're lucky now that we 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 understand from um, uh, from from data published um, uh, from from New York um, uh, that we can get commissural alignment in some eighty five percent of patients with, for example, Medtronic's valve. Uh, if you have commissural alignment, um, I, I don't think access to the coronary is a big issue. Um, there is obviously the issue of, of valve in valve going forward, TAVI in TAVI. Um, I, I think this is still a field that we're learning about, but very often you can understand um, from the initial upfront CT scan, whether or not you're gonna have enough room in the sinuses uh, to get out the side of, of a second valve, or indeed to create a stent graft uh, at the level of the sinuses by putting a second valve inside a first. So I think that upfront CT analysis work, um, things you should have in your mind is, what size valve am I going to put in? Where's the raffe? What is my maximal and minimal pre-dilatation or post-dilatation balloon sizes? Do I have enough room uh, in the sinuses to, uh, to um, uh, to, to get access to the coronaries? Do I have enough room in the sinuses uh, for future TAV and TAV? Thank you. Thanks, Darren, that's very clear. And I think, I think you're right, you know, it's very much dependent on operator experience and preference. I think before, you know, we, I'm not sure we can emphatically say there's one valve better than the other. It's really, I think you need to actually be able to use both for, for my customers because the anatomy is so variable, but generally we all tend to prefer one that just because we're more familiar with that valve. Uh, Bob? Yes. Hi, um, Darren. By a lot. I just want to first say that uh, I published a paper back in 2017 using Bob. some of your data from 2014. So I never thought I would meet you in person and it's nice to meet you. Uh, we wrote a paper on Tavaran bicuspid um, in Annals of Translational Medicine and helped out in circulation as well. Uh, I'll get to my question. In patients with bicuspid, they have uh, uh, cerebral aneurysms. They have uh, aortic uh, or aortopathy. They, they have sinus dilatation, aortic aneurysms, uh, they, and they have many genetic variation of this. It may not be a classic um, um, stenosis like coarctation. It may be just uh, aotopathy. Now, these patients are usually in their 50s and 60s. Do you take this into consideration when you do your CTA? Maybe you see like, uh, you know, mild dilatation of the aorta. Do you routinely scan their heads? There's increased stroke. I know most of the 
I know most of the strokes are um, ischemic and not hemorrhagic, but do you keep this into account that these patients have many pathologies, aortic pathologies, and indeed cerebral pathologies associated with their, um, with their comorbidity? And does, that, does this help your decision in pushing them towards SAVR versus TAVR? And do you think that this actually affects the outcomes that these patients may face? That's a that's a, a really great uh, a really great question and, and um, thank you for your kind words and for your contribution to this field uh, and I think you highlight the very important uh, distinction between just treating aortic stenosis and treating the patient as a whole um, as you suggest forty percent of these patients at least have significant aorthopathy that will require. Uh, a treatment or an intervention throughout the course of their life. Um, coronary um, um, locations are abnormal in 10% of these patients. 1% um, have coarctation. 0.7% have associated cerebral aneurysms uh, and probably many things that we don't understand. So when we're having this discussion, we're really talking about patients that don't have any of these features because I don't think that any of us would suggest that a 65 year old with a aortic root of five millimeters and severe AS should undergo a TADI. Um, those patients of course should go to surgery. Where it is a little bit more difficult, I think is, is um, in the patients that have some degree of aortic root dilatation, because we know that the aortic root dilatation is, is due to two factors. Part of it is due to hemodynamics, uh, And, and the jet uh, genetics and the, um, the missense mutation for the fibrillin gene. Um, overall, I think we need to take care of patients, not take care of the valve. And if a patient has, for example, a coarct that needs to be addressed, if a patient has a dilated aorta that needs to be addressed, yes, I would push that patient towards surgery, definitely. On the other hand, if we look at older patient groups who have aortopathy and bicuspid aortic valve, and the observational data, with the caveat of observational data, has not suggested that that aortopathy is associated with a bad outcome. It's not an independent predictor of adverse outcome, be that stroke or be that death, at 30 days or one year. So in the older patients, I think greater care is needed with uh, patients with aortopathy, but it would not necessarily make me push uh, an intermediate or a high-risk patient towards surgery. Thank you. Do you scan their heads? I, ha I haven't to date, but maybe that's something I need to start thinking about. So thank, thank you for that, Bob. I I've learned something, which is cool. Thanks, Bob. Nikos and Samina? Thank you so much for the great talk. Um, I uh, have a particular question about the risk of the stroke that you mentioned. And in your experience, I know there are a lot of gaps. Uh, in our knowledge to this date, but do you recommend a specific antiplatelet therapy regimen um, in this particular population of patients, higher risk for stroke, and compare with our regular aortic stenosis patients that we do cover? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure that we have enough information to, to, to go on there. Um, of course, you wanna have your ACT above 250 to 300 in the lab. Um, uh, you want to ensure that, you know, you've got an embolic protection device and we use them for all bicuspid patients. Um, but in the longer term follow-up, um, do I think that there's, there's a higher risk of valve thrombosis or, or, uh, or something? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Again, I'm, I'm very um, liberal with post-dilatation because I do believe that these patients, like, for example, a valve and valve subset can get malexpansion of the frame and can get localized leaflet thrombosis. Um, so that would be certainly something I would suggest. But no, we, we tend to use the standard uh, uh, aspirin 75 milligrams for, for all of those patients, unless they have another indication for, uh, for a novel anticoagulant. What, what, what are your thoughts, Samir? What, 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 do you got, what do you think? Yeah, we do the same. I mean, we're only using aspirin irrespective of whether it's bicuspid or tricuspid. And we use cerebral protection in all our elderly patients. The only low-risk patients, we use cerebral protection in our bicuspids. So we use it in all our bicuspids. 
Um, we don't use, you know, we don't use cerebral protection in a, in a tricuspid low risk patient, just because when you look at the data from the clinical studies and the low risk studies, the rate of stroke was so low. Um, so it's hard for us to kind of justify in that group. But um, so we kind of 70% usage here, um, 70 to 80% usage, not 100%. I mean, the one thing we don't know about, I think, yeah, I think the one thing we don't know about, and you raised, and I think the only way to really know about it is to have the randomized data, is we've all seen these cases of, of under expansion and out of round shapes, right? And even when you post dilate, you get better expansion, but you may still have an out of round valve. And I think that, you know, that picture you showed that see this kind of a balloon expandable valve, we all have those cases. I just, we, what we don't know is the durability when a valve is like that. And you know the companies will tell us uh, we've tested this to 200 million cycles, 600 million cycles in out of round shapes, but we've all learned it doesn't really mean anything. It just means that the valve's not going to like break down in two in two years, but it doesn't tell us how it's going to function at eight to ten years in a biological environment. And that's the thing. I think unless we actually do the studies, we really the other thing that bugs me is the durability. Is are we going to get similar durability in bicuspids versus tricuspids? Yeah, and, and if you consider all of the other issues um, in that they're, they're younger, more calcium, more difficulty getting into the coronaries potentially, um, higher gradients, mm -hmm. um, really that durability question is an issue. And, and so when we design that trial, sure, the one, two, five-year data are going to be important, but ultimately it's that 10-year data that we're going to look at and say, well, did we did we do as well in in the bicuspid as we did in the in the tricuspid data set? Um, and how do we compare the surgeon again? Because surgeons are agnostic to this; it's irrelevant to them mm -hmm. what type yeah. of valve it is. They get yeah. those they get those outcomes irrespective. And in younger patients, you know that's a good field for surgery because they don't have the comorbidities. Older mm -hmm. patients, it's a good it's a good field for TABR because they do have the comorbidities. Well, so I, I think we have a lot to learn there still. Before we go to Nikos, just because you mentioned post dilatation, there was a question from um, one of the audience about how do you size your balloon and what should be the limit for post dilatation as regards to significant PVL? And maybe also okay, so good, good lastly, question. what kind of balloon do you use? Okay, so, so good question. So I, I tend to do the same thing with bicuspids and tricuspids, to be honest in that what I do, um, when I look at the CT scan before the case, I'll have a look at the spinal tubular junction, have a look at the average diameter of those three. Therefore, let's just say the STJ is 24, but the LVOT is 26. Then the limit to my balloon is gonna be a 24. So I always respect the anatomy uh, of the patient. If we start pushing the anatomy with a balloon, um, it's gonna it, it's gonna hurt that patient eventually. You might get lucky and it's okay in the odd case, but ultimately it's gonna be associated with a bad outcome. So I think first respect the anatomy. The second thing you have to consider is that um, in all of these valves, uh, a 26 millimeter S3 or a 26 millimeter um, uh, core valve, their their leaflets are sutured into the commissure post uh, with a certain amount of uh, of flexibility, but not much. And Medtronic last year came out with a field safety notice suggesting that a 24 millimeter balloon was the maximum size balloon you can use in a 29 millimeter device uh, or uh, a 28 millimeter um, semi-compliant balloon in a 34 millimeter device. So you need to know your device as well and understand what are, what are the tolerances for your device. U ultimately, um, we tend to use um, softer balloons, semi-compliant balloons for a pre-dilatation and if I'm going to do a post dilatation, I tend to take a non-compliant balloon so that I can do one post dilatation with the maximal balloon for that patient. And so I'm not having to do repeated post dilatation. Great. Thanks, Darren. Uh, Nikos? Um, yeah, so my question is uh, kind of similar with uh, Bob's question uh, along the same lines. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, uh, does the degree of aortic insufficiency plays a role in your decision to go ahead and do the TAVR versus referring the patient to a, to a SAVR? Uh, and not necessarily having to do with the uh, aortic diameter, but intrinsic aortic insufficiency, does it do we have worse outcomes if we have like intrinsic aortic insufficiency upfront for these patients? 
Good question, Nikos. I, I don't think so. I, I think that we, we know with pure AR, we, we have more challenging procedures because trying to stick the valve to the anatomy is, is, is difficult. Um, we see that sometimes even with valve and valve patients where you open the valve, it slides down and you have to reposition and do it all over again. Um, if, uh, however, we're talking about patients who have severe aortic stenosis with calcific disease, who have concomitant aortic incompetence, I think that um, there's certainly enough calcium to, um, to stick the valve and therefore you would not expect to have an inferior longer term outcome. What does change a little bit is, is, is your use of, of pacing during the procedure. And in those situations, um, uh, what we tend to do is open the valve a little bit, uh, for example, be it a, a, a Medtronic valve, open it a couple of millimeters until you see the valve flaring, try and stick the valve down a lot more in aortic incompetence cases, um, but pacing tends to get you out of, uh, get you out of that trouble. Thank you very much. Anything else, what? No, just thinking about the future always, and um, I mean, thinking uh, if the role of uh, future preparation devices that right now are under development yeah. are going to be key um, for bicuspid valve uh, intervention. I think that mechanically speaking, uh, I agree with the team. I'm, I'm very concerned about the durability of valves. And, and we see that on the micro stage, when these valves get compressed, uh, the uh, entire hemodynamic um, performance actually mm -hmm. changes and leaflet degeneration occurs uh, early, which is something you don't want in a, in a, in a young patient. So mm -hmm. I really think we need to figure out ways to deal with that uh, Rafi. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there are already, you know, two, three interesting companies working on dedicated, uh, you know, leaflet uh, preparation technologies, cutting devices, leaflet softening, mm -hmm. decalcification, shocking, shock balloon like, so, so I really think it's actually quite interesting and, and I think the future needs something like that. Yeah, I mean, Darren's actually one of the few people in the world who's used Leaflex. Leaflex. So he can tell us actually uh, whether he thinks remodeling, leaflet remodeling therapies are going to have an impact here. What do you think, Darren? Yeah, it, it's either going to be leaflet remodeling therapies such as Leaflex, which of course is designed currently for um, uh, concentric well um, um, uh, well-spaced calcium. However, they do have a prototype for, for bicuspid. So they are, they are actively going after that market. And I think it's a smart idea. So it's either going to be something along those lines, or Azim, I know you did some, some work with, um, uh, with shockwave balloons in South America. Mm -hmm. um, so it's either going to be something like that, or it's going to be better, better tabber devices, right? So if you take a Sapien 3, for example, and you give, you give it more uh, expansion force from, from 12 to 20 millimeters, do you need to modify the leaflet? Okay, maybe that means that your, your device is a little bit bigger. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe your French size goes up a couple of notches because you've got, you've got more cobalt chromium uh, or a different cell design at the top. But in younger patients, they tend to have less peripheral vascular disease. That's probably not an issue anyway. So I, I, I think that the, the future for these patients is going to be, first of all, identifying those that are gonna be challenging. And, and we'll do that easily. CT scans, prospective registries are gonna identify the cases that are challenging and those that are not. And those that are not, we can treat them in the conventional way. TAVI is a very good treatment for patients with very smart, small, or example, it's type zero or true bicuspid. It's the long calcified raphate or the issue. And in those patients, we're going to section those ones out and we're going to have to do something special, either with a, a specific device. Um, if you look at the Chinese devices, uh, Microports, Vitaflow and, 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 and Venus MedTech, they have um, extra expansion force. They have ticker, um, nitinol um, with good ceiling cuffs to try and address the deficiencies that, that Western devices have, or it's going to be leaflet preparation. My feeling ultimately is that we're not going to want to do two procedures. We're not going to want to prepare the leaflets with some de technically challenging device and then put a taver in, in the same way we would currently with the silica. I think that we're going to come up with a device that's just going to be a single shot that's going to uh, that's going to treat these more challenging things. You may be right, and I think uh, that look into the future is a perfect place to end. Um, Darren, 
Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day. We really appreciate it. The fellows do. And we've all learned so much from you as usual. Looking forward to seeing you in person. Thank you, guys. Okay. See you soon. Thanks for having Bye -bye. me. All right. Take Thanks care. for having me, guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Have a good one.